In this next series of videos, we're going to be looking in more detail about detecting planets around other stars using this method called the radial velocity method. So I'm going to start off by introducing how it works, and after that we're going to go into some other videos about the details and some of the math behind it, just to show you exactly how it works so you get experience with it. I think it's a really good one, and we can actually use our basic laws of physics that we've been talking about in other videos in order to infer the existence of planets. Like this is really interesting. So how does it work? Well, um, if we have a planet, so a planet orbiting a star, what will it do? Well, it will cause the star to wobble back and forth. And that's sort of a weird word that's sometimes used, but I'll explain what I mean by that. To wobble back and forth. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to maybe show you that with an animation. This is again this one by PHET. This is the University of Colorado one. It's awesome. Very, very simplistic, and yet it works really well. So if I just do reset, I'm going to have this. This is the planet, and this is, uh, sorry, this is the star, and here's the planet. See, this has a much bigger mass than that one. And let's just say we did this. Look what happens. Of course, the planet orbits the star, but look carefully. The star also wobbles, or sort of the star moves because of the planet. Notice they're always sort of opposite in direction as well. So it turns out the planet doesn't just orbit the star and the star stays still. No. In fact, anytime you have something going around something else, they affect each other. Now, of course, the star moves a lot less than the planet. That's because the star is more massive. But what if they were closer in size? I mean, what if you had two stars that were very close in size? Well, then you can get something like a binary star, for example. This would be, this is even more complicated. We have two stars that are the same mass. You look at this uh, uh, yellow one and the sort of purplish pinkish one. Of course, then you have a little uh, planet going around this one. So it gets a little bit complicated looking. But I mean, you can have fun with these different orbits here and see sort of what everything looks like. But what I like though, is that you can see sort of what can happen in different situations. And what if I only wanted, for example, uh, yeah, three bodies. Yeah, we can just leave it at that actually. So the main point I want to show you is just that if we have a sun and a planet, for example, like in the case of an exoplanet going around a star, that we can see that this star right here will oscillate or sort of wobble back and forth because of the planet. And because of that, then, what we can do is we look at, so maybe we'll do a little diagram here. So if this right here is the star here, what's going to happen, of course, is the star, maybe I'll just draw it with some black around it here. That's the star. And we'll have the planet then going around it, of course. Now, of course, the planet is not seen, so we don't actually see it. But we sort of, we know it exists. We sort of infer its existence as it goes around. But what happens then is this. Here on Earth, if this is us here on Earth, and we're looking at the light from this right here. Okay, so this light sort of reaches us here. Now the light that reaches us, of course, at some point, though, this star is going to appear to be sort of coming towards us. Right? So that right there will actually be sort of, we're going to see some of the light when it comes sort of towards us. Sometimes the star is going to seem to be going away from us. So what we can do is we can take what's called the spectrum. So the spectrum of the star will show... So this is how we actually do it. We look at the spectrum of a star very carefully over time. And if we see spectral lines, again, that means we take the light from the star, we split it up. Uh, so let's say we split it up into its spectrum. So maybe this right here will be the wavelength of it. And let's say we're looking at a line that normally is here, let's just say. That's the sort of, that's this spectral line that has to do with a transition that's happening inside the star. So maybe it's, a, I don't know, hydrogen atom, or an electron, let's say, going up and then going down in energy. So then maybe you have some light being given off. So then you see this line at a very particular wavelength. What you're going to see then is as a star goes towards you, you have this Doppler effect. So sometimes this is called the, the Doppler effect instead of radial velocity method. But what you do is basically you look for this line, so the spectrum of the star will show spectral lines being shifted, and they will shift uh, from blue to red,
to blue to red, etc. So that's what you're going to notice. So you're going to see these lines are here going. Basically, this line is going to go to a smaller value and a smaller wavelength. We call that blue shifted. It doesn't necessarily look more blue. It just gets smaller wavelengths. So maybe it goes that way. And then, of course, what happens is it's also going to sometimes shift to the right. So maybe this way here like this. So what's going to happen really is that it's this line here is going to appear to go sort of back here and then forth and then back and then forth and back and then forth over time. And what does that tell us? This is the key thing here. That tells us uh, what? That the um, star is moving towards that's when it's blue shifted or away from us red shifted and then the key thing is then is this we infer that it is caused by an exoplanet or by an unseen planet. So if we see the light from a star, so again, we just take a look at the spectrum of a star very carefully. We look at these lines, and if we look at them really, really carefully, sort of zoom way in, because they don't actually move much. But if we look way in and we see these lines going back and forth and back and forth at a very regular sort of period here, then we can actually say, aha, that tells us the star is going towards us, away from us, towards us, away from us. And the only thing that we know that could cause that is this. See, if we're over here on Earth looking at the light, look at this. See, now the star would be coming towards us, and now it'd be going away from us. So right now it'd be towards us, so it'd be blue shifted, and then red shifted going away. And then blue shifted as it comes towards us, and then red shifted as it goes away. So from that, we can infer the existence of this unseen planet. So that's the basic idea behind the radial velocity method. Now, what can we actually tell from this method? I mean, what can we actually gain from this? Well, it turns out we can tell a couple of things. We can tell the mass. So I'll say we can tell the mass of the exoplanet. So it turns out we can actually weigh it in a sense. We can also say it's uh, the orbital radius of the exoplanet. Now, I'm going to use the word ex uh, the orbital radius, but it turns out it's actually not really the orbital radius. It's actually the semi-major axis. And that's what we call, that's because the orbits are actually ellipses. So you have to call the semi-major axis, which is given by this letter A here. But I'm going to call it the orbital radius. We're going to assume it's a circle here. So orbital radius of the planet. And we can even then tell the, um, well, we can at least guess at the temperature of the planet. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us something about could there be life on it. Because if it's a temperature where you could have liquid water, well, then we'd be really interested in looking at this one. So if we see, a, if we sort of calculate that the temperature on this planet is something that might be conducive to having liquid water, we get very excited about these planets. So let's go into a little bit more details here. What kind of assumptions do we need to make? Well, we're going to, in order to sort of use this model, because I'm going to show you a simplified version of what scientists do. But um, this is actually still very, very good. You're going to see we get results that are very close to the accepted ones. So using some sort of just basic physics assumptions like we're going to do, we're going to get answers that are very close to what are accepted. These are scientists doing you know, computer models and including everything they can. We're going to get very close to the real results here. So we're going to assume, first of all, that the orbits are circular. That was sort of implied, I think, in my last statement there, where I said that we're gonna, you know, we can tell the semi-major axis. We're gonna assume the orbits are circular. We're also going to assume that the star only has one exoplanet, because if it has more, then these perturbations or these sort of the way the star goes back and forth is going to be more complicated. If you have you know, two or three stars, the star, uh, sorry, planets, you have two or three planets going around the same star, 
which we've actually detected. There's lots of stars now that we've seen that have multiple planets, just like our own sun has lots of planets. Well, it turns out that causes very complicated looking uh, sort of shapes to this. Now, scientists can deal with this, but in our own assumptions, we're just going to keep it nice and simple. So circular orbits only has one exoplanet. And we're going to assume that the orbital plane, we're going to assume that it's uh, parallel to our line of sight. What do I mean by that? We're going to assume basically that this thing is perfectly lined up with us. In other words, if we're looking at a side view, if this right here is the star, so I'll draw a little star here. We're going to assume that the orbital plane of this sort of exoplanet sort of going around, is going to be exactly lined up with us. If this is us looking at it here on Earth like this. In other words, we're going to assume that as it goes back and forth, we're seeing the maximum amount of deviation. Because what if I took this thing right here? Let me see if I can just do this here. I'm going to try to rotate it. Can I? Yeah. What if I did like this? Well, then if you look at this, we'd only detect these sort of component in this direction. It turns out that's why we have this angle, and we have this, it's called the angle of inclination. So it turns out all we can say is that this is the sort of is the upper limit. So we're going to assume these things are here are lined up perfectly with us here. The plane of orbit is lined up with us. And with that, then, we can do some neat things. But we're going to need some information. So what are we going to need? We're going to need to know the luminosity of the star. And that's a difficult thing to get. Okay, so we're going to call that L with a little star, maybe like this, so L star. How do we actually get that? We can actually do it. We do, first of all, we take the spectrum of the star. This is how we do it. We take the spectrum of a star that tells us um, the spectral class. So what we would do, let's say we know this, we take a spectrum of the star, we know it's a main sequence, let's say, and let's say it's an A class. Well, then we can say, all right, that means it's a, one of these. From there, then, we can infer its luminosity. So that, I'm going to say, that gets us luminosity. That's how we're going to do it. It turns out we could also get so if we wanted to, I'll say we could also know the mass of the star then. Because from here it turns out, remember that the uh, luminosity of a star is actually related to its mass. Right? We have this relation that the luminosity is approximately the mass to the power of around, let's say, 3.4 or so. So if you know the luminosity, then you can tell the mass. You can actually calculate it. So that's sort of one of the things that we need to know is the luminosity of the star. And we get that by knowing its spectrum. Then if it's a main sequence, at least we can go up this uh, Hertzsprung-Russell diagram graph here and then go to the left and look at luminosity here. Another thing we're going to need to know is, so maybe I'll say this, uh, I should maybe have labeled this sort of number one here. One, luminosity of a star. We'll say two. We would also need to know T, which is the orbital period of the star. And if we know the orbital period of the star, we also know the orbital period of the planet. So this is a real graph of what you actually might see. This is actually one called Kepler B. So this is the graph of its velocity as it's going sort of up and down and up and down. This is its what we call the radial velocity. That's why we call it the radial velocity method. So this star, if this is sort of its equilibrium point sort of zero like this, it's sort of going away from you and then it's sort of coming towards you, then away from you, then towards you. And by this, we can tell two things from this graph. We can tell the orbital period. That's because let's say we knew uh, this point and we go to this point right here, that right there will give us the T, the period. That will of course be measured in days, uh, sorry, in seconds. We can measure that in seconds. And number three, from the same graph here, we can also tell um, V star, I'm going to call it, which is the, uh, the stars, uh, let's say the maximum speed, or actually I'll say maximum radial velocity, because that's what it's doing, right? It's going towards you or away from you in sort of a radial direction. 
So V star, the star is a maximum radial velocity. And let's say I labeled that in green instead of blue, just to sort of color code things a bit. So let's say I said V star here. What I could do from this graph is I could draw sort of a dotted line here. And then from there I can tell in sort of this height from here to here, that is going to be V star. This height here, because that's the amplitude of this graph. So V star, that's the amplitude of the graph here. And this one right here, the orbital period, well that's the that's the period of the graph. That's sort of how we do this one. Okay, so this is the things we need. We need to know the orbital period, the maximum radial velocity of the star, and we also need to know the luminosity of the star. And with those things, then we have all the ingredients we need in order to do some super cool calculations, I think, because we can do some real science just with this one graph. Turns out after you've done uh, what I've shown you, you can actually look up on uh, exoplanet.eu, uh, you can actually look up a Kepler B 10b. You'll see a graph like this right here if you look at the paper associated with it. From that one graph here, you can actually then tell its uh, V star here, its radial velocity, and you can also tell its period here. And it turns out then just by knowing the period and the velocity and knowing something about the star, which is also given in that web page, then you can calculate everything you need to know about Kepler 10b. And then you can compare your results with what they actually state. And you'll see your results will be very, very close to what's accepted. How cool is that?